Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Blunting Occam's Razor. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at what is the paradox of linguistic elegance. Now, now that we have covered some issues with parsimony, the number of things that a theory posits, we're going to look at some of the issues with the concept of elegance, how simply the theory is stated semantically. The biggest issue here is the paradox of linguistic elegance. Simply put, this is the issue that the same theory may be more or less elegant depending on the way it was written or the language it is written in, and that there is no objective language with which to judge the simplicity of a theory. To understand this, take a look at these examples. Which theory is the most elegant? Theory 1, all A's are B's. Theory 2, all A's are either C's or D's. And Theory 3, all A's are E's or F's in certain situations, but H's or I's in other situations. You might claim that Theory 1 is the most elegant because it states the case the most simply. The other theories could be broken up into multiple premises if needed. However, depending on your language, it might be the case that these are all actually the same theory, just stated slightly differently because of the limitations of the language. Theory 2's language might not have a word for B's by themselves, as we might need to say C's or D's, but this isn't an artifact of natural kinds out in the world, but rather simply an artifact of the language. The point is that a theory that seems inelegant in one language may be very elegant in another, and it's completely arbitrary which things we've dedicated words for, and which things require a more complicated description. We should not be picking theories based simply on certain quirks of how language developed. We can see this even with formal languages in terms of the level to which you define certain terms may prescribe how complicated your uh, theories or your axioms or your assumptions need to be. This is a general version of a more specific paradox offered by Nelson Goodman, referred to as the Gru paradox or the riddle of the new riddle of induction. We have an old video on the channel about that if you want to check it out. But the short version here is that there's no reason to prefer the hypothesis that all emeralds are green over the hypothesis that all emeralds are gru. Gru meaning green now, but they will turn blue at some point in the future. Goodman makes the case that the only reason we prefer green to gru is a matter of linguistic entrenchment. We're very used to using green and we think gru is strange. It seems like a strange and overly complicated predicate. However, if we were used to using GRU, green would seem like a strange and overly complicated predicate because it would need to be defined as GRU before a certain time, but BLEEN afterward, BLEEN being the opposite of GRU. Check out that video if you're curious on this. The point here is that the language that we choose has impacts on how simple we think something is. And so, if the language we choose is arbitrary, then the simplicity of something, or particularly the elegance of a theory, is completely arbitrary. And so we can't use elegance as a way to determine which theories are true because it's going to be different based on the language. Now, the proponent of elegance might, as a criteria, might argue that we can speak about things in objective language that is not dependent on the particular language in which it's stated. We can craft terms that are broadly agreed upon to form natural kinds, and borrow terms from other languages when we lack the exact term in our own. This relies on the intuition that there are natural groupings of things, or natural kinds that we can find and use in objective terms. I have some questions and issues with this, but check out our video on natural kinds for more on this and my objections. But the issue is that theories inherently do need to group individual things into predicates to make predictions. X is the same kind of thing as Y, so X will behave the same in the future as Y did in the past. However, there are near infinitely many ways to divide up the many things that there are in the universe, and it's very hard to make the case that one division is right or the most accurate. One predicate may lead to a theory being more complicated, while another might make it simpler, but this is an arbitrary feature of the language used, not something inherent about the theory. The most obvious example of this is color, arguably one of the most basic properties of any object. Here's the question for you, for the proponent of natural kinds. Are colors natural kinds? And if so, what are they? 
Different languages have different numbers of colors. Some languages only have words for red, black, and white. Other languages have many, many more words. The colors that are picked and the particular hues that are then assigned to each of these colors differ by language. If you have only three words, more hues are going to fall under each word. Given that color is just an electromagnetic spectrum, it doesn't seem like there are any objective delineations between which are the correct kinds for color. But color is a word that we use, and colors are words that we use, importantly, to describe complicated chemical reactions that we see. Something changes color has some important meaning to us. And it seems to be a term that we try to use to describe objects or lump objects together. We lump objects by color. These particular rocks are emeralds because they're one color and rubies because they're a different color. Now, it may not be the only thing we're using, but it's an emblematic example. This causes an issue because in some languages it will be very hard to describe certain sets of hues taking a lot of words, while in other languages there simply is a word for orange or for teal. The problem is that there's no way to tell which language the theory should be judged in. If one theory is simpler in one language and uh, another is simpler in a different language, it seems impossible to objectively evaluate their comparative elegance. In other words, even if you think that natural kinds exist out there in the world, we don't yet agree on what those natural kinds are. And as long as there are two people that group particular natural kinds differently and say, this is a set of natural kinds and that's a set of natural kinds, and someone else that says something different, it's possible for us to have this issue where using one set of terms for natural kinds and using one set of groupings something is simpler. One theory is simpler while using a different set of groupings and a different set of terms. A different theory is simpler. So until we all agree that, yep, this is the objectively right way to group things like colors, there's no way for us to distinguish which theory is actually more elegant because there will be multiple languages in which they can be described, and those languages are going to be different by how complicated they are, just like with gru and green. What may actually be driving this is nothing more than human preference. We like things that are simple. Simple ideas catch on, they spread, they grow. Even if we don't consciously pick theories that are more elegant, those theories that are able to be simply stated may be more likely to catch on, simply because people are more likely to understand and remember them. Therefore, more people will remember them, more people will say them, more people will write them down, will tell other people about them, and so on. This explains the focus on elegance because we don't actually think that these theories are more likely to be true, but rather they're more likely to survive the world of academic Darwinism. They're more likely to become popular, they're more likely to be talked about on the news, and therefore more people are likely to understand them. While an interesting psychological conclusion, this poses issues for the rationality of science if theories are chosen simply because they appeal to human preferences for simplicity, and if there's no objective connection between the elegance of a theory and its truth value. If all elegance is, is a way to make sure that your your theory gets published, or your theory gets notoriety, or your theory gets picked up by other humans, elegance may be an important feature of a theory, but it has nothing to do with that theory's truth value. Rather, it has to do with the ability of that theory to self-propagate throughout humans and uh, become more convincing, but it has nothing to do with the truth value. And so if what we're actually picking up on with Occam's razor is, in terms of elegance, is whether or not a theory is likely to be picked up by others, we should completely separate it from claiming that it makes it more true, but rather claiming that it makes it more persuasive. One might respond that limiting the number of assumptions that we make is a risk mitigation strategy. Every time we assume something without argument, we have a chance of being wrong. The fewer things we assume, the lower chances of our being wrong. However, this argument runs into a number of problems. The prob principle of explosion, prior probabilities, and language. Principle of explosion claims that from the faults, anything follows. This is a logical principle. If you have a couple basic rules of logic, it means that if you ever assume something that's false, everything's going to fall apart, and you can prove absolutely anything you want. Once you have one false assumption, you're able to conclude anything. So limiting false claims does little to reduce the overall scale of the risk. Further, there is the issue of prior probabilities. We don't know the chances of any given claim being false. It's not like they all have an equal chance of being false, but we just don't know what those chances are. It could be that the single claim you picked to keep is very likely to be false, while if you had picked several claims, they each had a much higher chance of being right. 
Finally, what must be stated in two sentences in one language might be able to be stated in a single sentence in another, returning us to the underlying paradox that elegance is arbitrary based on the language you pick. What do you think? Is there a way to determine which theories are objectively more elegant, or is it all dependent on the language? Do we just prefer elegant theories because they're easier to remember and understand, or is there a real connection to epistemic justification here? Are elegant theories actually more likely to be right, or are they simply more likely to be shared and spread about? Watch this video and more here at carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.